Hello, everyone. I have a statement, and then we'll be happy to answer a few questions. Today, Judge Bachman has affirmed our position that Johnson & Johnson, motivated by greed and avarice, is responsible for the opioid epidemic in our state. Johnson & Johnson will finally be held accountable for thousands of deaths and addiction caused by their activities. Throughout the trial, our, tr our, our team proved what we have alleged all along, that the company used pseudoscience and misleading information that downplayed the risks of opioids, leading to the worst man-made public nuisance our state and this country has ever seen, the opioid crisis. As a result, when opioid sales in Oklahoma began to skyrocket, the death toll from unintentional prescription drug-related overdoses mounted, leaving in its wake broken homes, families, and communities. We showed how the company repeatedly ignored warnings by the federal government and its own scientific advisors about the dangers of its drugs and the risks of marketing its products in the way it did. The company promoted its products through unbranded campaigns by funding front groups and many patient groups meant to look like grassroots organizations that spread the company's misinformation. We have proven that Johnson & Johnson built its billion dollar brand out of greed and on the backs of pain and suffering of innocent people. Although we showed the way Johnson & Johnson created the, the epidemic, we also showed the brilliant work of those in the state who've been serving on the front lines. These are individuals at agencies like the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services, led by Commissioner Terry White, uh, Tom Bates and his team at the Department of Health, and at the OSU Center for Wellness and Recovery, led by Drs. Casey Shrum, Jason Beeman, and Julie Craw. These people I just named and the countless others who I didn't are heroes. It is safe to say that without them, there would be thousands more dead and even more would still be in the clutches of addiction. At this trial, we heard from national experts like Dr. Andrew Kolodny, who is regarded as the nation's foremost expert on the opioid epidemic in the U.S. He demonstrated how Johnson & Johnson took data out of context with respect to their branded opioids, minimized safety issues related to those opioids, omitted material information related to the safety of their opioids, and made comparative efficiency claims about their opioids without substantial evidence. And possibly the most significant and heart-rending part of our trial was when we gave the world a glimpse of what victims of the epidemic look like. Christy Hughes and John McGregor nearly lost everything to their addictions. And they were the lucky ones. They lived to tell their stories. Because in our state, there are countless families, like the family of OU football star Austin Box, his parents Craig and Gail, go to bed every night and wake up every morning to the insufferable reality of knowing they will never see their beautiful son, Austin, again. And because Johnson & Johnson targeted pregnant women in our state, we also heard from the executive director of Pepper's Ranch, Tanya Ratcliffe, who discussed what it's like caring for babies born with an addiction to opioids. We saw an actual video of a newborn shaking uncontrollably as it suffered from the effects of neonatal abstinence syndrome. From the minute these babies draw their first breath, their lives are negatively impacted and perhaps will never be the same. Regrettably, we can't change the past. We can never bring back those who lost their lives because Johnson & Johnson executives made the calculated and cold-blooded decision that they were going to produce a mutant strain of poppy, corner the market, and supply massive amounts 
of the active ingredients for other companies to manufacture opioids around the nation and in Oklahoma. The family members who still struggle with the loss of a loved one will remain the victims devastated, devastated by this corporate greed forever. I know personally and have met with and spoken to families of those whose loved ones have been erased by an opioid overdose. Words will never be enough to take their pain away. I do, however, hope that today Judge Bachman's decision will provide some solace to the thousands of families who have tragically lost a loved one due to an opioid overdose. And today should also inspire a sense of optimism to those struggling with an opioid addiction because we are committed to getting you the help you need to reclaim your life and your future. It has taken over two years for us to get here. There have no doubt been some bumps along the way. Uh, we suffered through attacks and obstacles, moments of trepidation and worry, but also moments of hope and today, great triumph. Through it all, this incredible team has stuck together. And I want to say it took tremendous courage from this team of highly skilled attorneys. These are attorneys who've suffered greatly, not just during this case, being away from their families and not taking on other work, but many on this team have lost loved ones to addiction at the hand of these deadly drugs. They know firsthand the anguish of burying a family member who they first had to watch spiral into despair. Judge Mike Burridge, his law partner Reggie Witten, and everyone at Witten Burridge, Brad Beckworth and his team at Nix Patterson, and also from my office, First Assistant Don Cash, General Counsel Abby Dillsaver, the many assistant AGs, paralegals, and support staff put in just as much time as, and effort as everybody who was in court these last seven weeks. We persevered. We did so because we knew that in the end, we were going to be on the right side of history. We will look back on this dark period and know that we stood up for Oklahomans to take on Goliath. It has not been easy, but it has been well worth it. Finally, just as we've said several times at different stages of this case, when Johnson & Johnson pulled out all stops to try to derail and stall the case, we appreciate Judge Bachman's wisdom and openness. He clearly saw through all the company's desperate acts to delay justice for Oklahomans. In closing, what we showed during our seven-week trial and what Judge Bachman confirmed today is what we know now for certain. Johnson & Johnson was the kingpin behind the nation's ongoing opioid crisis. And I have a message for the CEO of Johnson & Johnson. On Monday of last week, the Business Roundtable, a group that represents CEOs of big corporations, declared that it had changed its mind about the purpose of corporations. That purpose is no longer to maximize profits for shareholders, but to benefit other stakeholders as well, including employees, customers, and citizens. Johnson & Johnson is a member of the Business Roundtable, and I'm asking the CEO of Johnson & Johnson Alex Gorski, to put his money where his mouth is and get out his checkbook. Amen. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Question over here and then here. Uh, are you disappointed at all in the uh, 572 million? Well, uh, Robert Browning once said, a man's reach should exceed his grasp, or what's a heaven for? <laughs> so we took the position that uh, given all the scientific uh, review all the expert consultation uh, that we did uh, with with folks like Terry and her team uh, with addiction scientists in the state and around the country that uh, given the potential uh, for folks to relapse and given the extent of the epidemic uh, dealing with it comprehensively uh, was something that we felt uh, was the most responsible way to address this so we gave the judge a 20 year uh, 20 year plan a 30 year plan Again, that was designed to ensure that we were dealing with everything uh, that this defendant caused. 
So what we have is cumulatively from, other, from the other defendants in this case, we've been able to put together almost a billion dollars uh, to help people in the state uh, deal with the consequences of their actions. And we're very proud to be where we are today. Uh, the judge's order, as we've reviewed it, is very clear with respect to the actions of the defendant and its culpability with regard to the epidemic in the state. Question over here, then here. Question over here. Could you explain, so it's for what you were asking for 17 billion. This was 572 million. The judge said one year. Do you go back to the judge and ask for more? Or to the legislature, as the, the judge said this is now, should be addressed by the legislature? Well, it's a, it's a 40 plus page opinion. Uh, we have speed readers on our team, but they don't read that fast. So we're going to spend some time uh, looking at the opinion. Uh, we've also, uh, we've, I've already started meetings with the uh, leadership of uh, the legislature and the governor. So uh, there's going to be a united front with regard to how we proceed with this. Um, it's uh, it's, it's going to be an important step forward in dealing with the epidemic. You know, certainly uh, we would have liked to walk out of here with $17.5 billion, $17 billion in change, uh, but realistically, uh, we've been able, again, to put together almost a billion dollars to help Oklahoma work its way through. Question here and then right there. Other states are watching this case because they have pending litigation against these pharmaceutical companies. In your mind, is this a day of reckoning for pharmaceutical companies? Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's no question about it. And the record that's now available to my colleagues in other states is certainly something that's going to assist this process around the country. Uh, there is no question in my mind that we had to bring this case, that it had to be tried, uh, that these facts uh, had to see uh, sunlight. Uh, that's been accomplished here. And at the end of the day, uh, you can't sit in a corporate suite somewhere for the last 20 years and oversupply the country. Uh, 10 times more of this drug was coming in. And then you had, concomitantly, 15 times more people dying from opioid overdoses. So there's no question in my mind that uh, these companies knew what was going on at the highest level. Um, they just couldn't quit making money from it, and that's why they're responsible. Mr. Hey, General, what does it mean to you? Um, Austin Buck's parents stood outside and were crying, kind of just talking about how this is such a win for Oklahoma today. Um, they've credited you all, the entire team, and with, with really going up against this big and bloody battle, honestly. And, and we know that all eyes are on the state today. As So one of the things that's, uh, that's important about the job that I have and uh, the job that these gentlemen have assisted me in, in doing the last seven weeks is I've, I've got an oath of office to the people of the state, the four million people of the state. And they all have, they all have families and friends. Uh, they all have things that are important to them. And if you ever get to the point, uh, as I believe happened in these corporate suites, where you're looking at people as data points, or you're looking at all this death and destruction as a, as a cost of doing business that you don't have to incur. If you ever get to that point, you really ought to be ashamed of yourself. And again, that's why I'm asking the CEO of Johnson & Johnson to step up, put his money where his mouth is, get this judgment paid so that we can start helping Oklahomans. The boxes were a continuing inspiration to us. And for those of you who've, who've got young people who've gotten injured and they've been given painkillers, uh, you're lucky. Because you never know. You might be in that one out of four, one out of five universe of people who's got a vulnerability to addiction. You don't know it. It's part of your physiology. And that's another big part of this. They didn't know. There's never been any authoritative studies that determine the extent to which you can become addicted to a prescription opioid. But they didn't care. So specifically, um, Austin and Gail have been inspirations to us. And every time I think about Austin, and I know a lot of us feel that way, you know, we think about our children. Reggie, what does it mean? And, you know, so many people don't realize, uh, watching on the national stage, that you had such a personal um, impact. What does this day mean for you and your loved ones? I saw your wife in the courtroom and a lot of members of your family. Tell us a little bit about what this day means for you. 
Let's. Uh, <coughs> Come around here, ready? It's a, it's a pretty hard question to answer. I'll try. I feel like my boy's looking down. And it's a pretty, pretty tough deal. But I think my son and Austin are celebrating today. And we got to get help to, to these other kids. So I'm very grateful for the court, for what he did. And it uh, depends on what you know, these other companies do now. Am I optimistic? No, I'm not. I, I, think, I think they'll uh, appeal this thing and fight till hell freezes over. But my boy and Austin are fighters. And we are too. No. What's your message to families out there that have loved ones dealing with this tonight? It's hard because you love your kids and you know, you're know you looking at the worst thing they ever did in their whole life. And that's all people judge them by. Austin was a good boy. My son was a good boy. They got sick. And we didn't know what to do. I know what caused it now. And I plan on fighting it in some form or fashion the rest of my life. But... Uh, Anyway, I'm still here, and I'm going to keep fighting. Thank you. Thank, thank you. General Hunter, what's next for the, the that's, that money that the judge has ordered? I know he went through a list of what he could pay for. Does the legislature actually make those decisions? And then also, how much that goes to the judge? Well, I've said all along that, that on the back end of this, there's going to have to be implementing legislation. Um, so next steps are something that we're going to have to work through, again, with uh, the state's leaders. Uh, but going forward, the judge left open. Um, I guess the strong possibility, and in fact, um, I think he forecasted that there are going to be subsequent orders uh, that will clarify and implement the opinion. So those are all things that uh, we're going to have to work through over the coming days and weeks. Somebody else? Castile. Um, your decision to narrow this case down to just public nuisance, was, do you see that now as the right call? No question about it. Could the state have gotten more money, though, if it had proven fraud in this case? Uh, in our judgment, the best way to proceed, the, the complexity of the other claims in our case, uh, we evaluated carefully. Uh, we also, uh, again, we're looking towards what do we need to do to address not only the present but the future. And so as we looked at, as we looked at public nuisance law, uh, it was clear to us that that was the best way to maximize uh, any kind of a judgment that we were able to obtain in court here. And so uh, no looking back. We made the right decision. I'm confident, Chris. Thanks. Uh, so my understanding of where we are in the contract is uh, if we're able to finalize this judgment, get it collected, if Gorski writes a check, um, there'll be uh, most of this is going to be subject to a, a single digit um, retainer on the part of the, of the team. Uh, there's a small part of it that will be, uh, I think, uh, just over 10 percent. Other questions? Over here. Everything's on the table. Other questions? Back here and then over here. Just, just curious, uh, do you all think uh, Johnson & Johnson attorneys uh, underestimated you guys? They were just going to come in, in here and steamroll you? Brad, you want to talk about that? <laughs> sure. <laughs> this little group's been underestimated our whole lives. And what a lot of you all don't know is the team behind you that helped support us. Uh, has truthfully for two years lived in an office. Many people lived on mattresses in Judge Burge's office, including myself. And we've all had personal losses, nothing like Reggie's, but real ones. And a lot of difficulty along the way. Um, at every turn, J&J &J has been a company of what I can only call institutional arrogance. They have called our claims baseless. They have laughed at Commissioner White more than once, who, if you guys don't know, is the longest serving commissioner of mental health in this entire country. And everyone out there should look at what she did. 
uh, in her career before this case and also in the abatement plan that she and our team put together because it is a map of what needs to happen in this country. Um, they've underestimated General Hunter. You guys probably know that they have run everything they could at him. And even during this trial, when we had proven that these drugs are, in their own experts' words, up to 25% addictive, and that one in 15 people will turn to heroin after prescription drug use, even after their own corporate representative said that they have never done the testing to tell you whether when your child is prescribed one of their drugs, they will become an addict and die. They sat in that chair in that witness stand and said they had zero responsibility for this crisis. And today, for the first time in Oklahoma history and in this entire country, due to the leadership of this man and the help of this woman, we know that the root of this entire crisis began in Tasmania and New Jersey with Johnson & Johnson. And they can't laugh anymore. They can't call this case baseless anymore. And they had 100 lawyers working against a team of 13 and the Attorney General staff who has a lot of jobs. And we beat them at every turn, including today. So I don't know, Wayne, if that answers your question, but um, these one, two guys and us have one never backed down. Hey, Bob. One more question in the non Randy Ellis down here, Bob, and then maybe just one more after that. I'm interested in knowing from Terry White what she thinks she can do with a, nearly a billion dollars in, in a major crisis. Go ahead, Terry. So if you look at this being a one-year judgment with a billion dollars, just taking the $572 million by itself for one year, knowing that it's one year, 20 years, right? We're talking $11 billion. 30 years, as we think it will take to abate the crisis, we're talking $15 billion. I think we are right on track to start the necessary treatment, prevention, education, both public education and medical education programs. Obviously, I'm not an attorney and have not read the order that just was released that was over 40 pages, but I'm really hopeful this is the big, giant first step in year one, that we are going to be the first state in the nation to abate this crisis. One more question. Last chance. Okay, one more. Oklahoma isn't leading in a lot of categories, to be honest with you. You guys are on the forefront of this. On this, what do you want this to to mean in the future for other states to look to Oklahoma for some sort of leadership in something like this? Well, I think this exercise is a model, and uh, again, I uh, I can't say enough about the team uh, that we deployed mm -hmm. here. Um, the lawyers that work for these gentlemen. But, but uh, but I'm, I'm getting there. Because you were, you guys took it on and were willing to do it. And, and what I would say uh, in answer to your question is, if you put a team together and you're, you're able to steel yourself um, against all the opposition, all the criticism uh, that you're going to get uh, for taking on companies like this, at the end of the day, it's about talent and resolve and courage. And this team had the talent and resolve and courage to take this case to trial and win. And so that's the message to other states. Um, we did it in Oklahoma, and you can do it elsewhere. Okay? Thank you all very much.